Good morning. Today I will be reading Luke 5, verses 33 to 39. In this passage, Jesus is questioned by, about fasting, and it says, They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the, the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, Can you make the friends of your bridegroom fast while he is with them? But time will come when the bridegroom will take, be taken from them, and those days they will fast. He told, he told this parable, no one, te- no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have, have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wineskin will burst the new wine will burst the skin, the wine will run out, and the wine skin will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into n- new wine skins, and no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for they say the old is better. Thank you, Zach. Lots of holiday things going up, lots of exciting things happening, and so I hope you're ready. Uh, You don't have that long before you're going to be wrapping presents and all of that kind of thing. And that's one of the things we want to be doing. There are some families that are connected with the school that we help with, and they are some of the poorest families. And the school knows and sees these kids every single day. And so they have identified who those families are and allowed us then to be able to supply some presents for them. And so there are some tags at the Welcome Center, and if you will just pick up one of those, uh, there's a whole bunch. So it's just to buy one gift for them. And so if you would like to do that and help support a family that is Uh, very much struggling, Uh, not just someone that we see and says that they are, but this is people that the school knows, that these these families really need this. And so if you would like to give, that's a place where you're able to do that. We will be collecting those gifts, and then later on, like December 20th, on a Wednesday night, we will take and deliver those gifts. And so you're able to go and take those and see the family, whether you bought a gift or not. And so that's just always a good time to be able to do things like that and to be able to share some of the things that we have. All right, so I want to talk today about, and this may seem like a strange subject, patches and new wine. That seems like an odd thing, but it's one of the things that Jesus talks about And I think it's really, really important for us today in the way in which we live because a lot of people don't seem to get Jesus. They don't seem to understand what he's really talking about or or what he's all about. The Pharisees and the rulers are asking Jesus here about devotion time, about their quiet time, about their religious practices. We would call them spiritual disciplines. And so they're going, well, why don't your disciples fast? Everybody else fasts. The Pharisees fast. John's disciples fast. And to them, I suppose, if everyone followed the same rules, then we could all be okay. But there are rules, right? I mean, everybody has to have church at a certain time. You can't break rules. Everybody has to. And this is one of their have-tos. Why don't your disciples fast? They must not be as spiritual as the rest of us because... They don't fast. And so when you look at this, fasting is maybe the big one. You know, how much time do we give for religion? How much energy? How much effort? How do you tell if somebody is really a good Christian or not? Well, because they showed up here on a Sunday morning, of course. Uh, If you see them on a Wednesday night, then, wow, they're really a good Christian. Uh, we do it by that. How much time did you put in and study? Did you read your Bible every day? And so we want those kind of check marks to say, I am a good Christian because I did this. And fasting is one of their check mark ticks that they can say, okay, I'm a good person. I had quiet time. I had prayer time. I had study time. I had fasting time. I had 
you know, all of these different things. But fasting here is for a reason. You see, it may not have been for a reason with John and the Pharisees. You fast because you're supposed to fast. And Jesus says, no, it's more about what's going on. The reason why you would fast is for an intensity of prayer and asking of God. And that's the reason why. You don't fast when you go to a party. It kind of destroys the point of the party. If you're wanting to ask God for something, if you're wanting even just comfort because you're sad and you want comfort from God, then fasting is an approach to God that says, I'm going to leave off the things that I would eat and I'm going to take my time during that when I would normally be eating and I'm going to pray. Because obviously then you have some more time for God. And so that was what fasting was used for, is for a greater way to seek God. And so they were fasting for a reason. So as you look at the the dialogue and the way this goes along, they're asking about this and they're asking about this fasting. And it seems to be that, that it's usually during a time of sorrow. It's a time of loss. It's a time of decision. It's a time when you're trying to get closer to God. It's for all of those things. And Jesus is saying, I'm right here. Why would they fast? I am right here. And, of course, the Pharisees aren't really getting that. And so he goes into this explanation about patches and new wine. I don't know how many of you have done patches. Should we check? Well, probably not on a Sunday morning. We don't wear those. Those are more for Monday, right? We'll be wearing the patched ones tomorrow. So, and we almost don't do this anymore, because, and at least if you have patches, you just iron them on. You don't sew them on. And it, you know, of course, pulls the glue off. And, you know, then they're no good anymore. And we have to reapply. But patches during this time, if you put an unshrunk piece of cloth onto, a, you know, your blue jeans that you washed a hundred times. And then you wash those together. It's going to tear. It's going to pull. It's going to pucker. And it might even just rip a new hole in the whole thing. And so he's saying it won't work for that. That's the principle of patches and what patches were done for. There's too much strain. There's too much pressure on that. Wineskins were something that were used all the time. I mean, where are you going to put the wine? They don't have glass bottles. And so they had the skin of a goat, and they would sew it up, and they would put their wine into the wineskin. Well, the... I don't know if it adds greater flavor or not. Not sure I would want to find out either. Uh, But as you let it ferment, which is what actually makes it into wine, there has to be yeast, there has to be sugar, and you put it in there. And so now it's going to make this wine, but it also expands. Well, there's only so many times you can do that. And the number of times you can actually do that is one Because if you do it a second time, it's going to pop. It's already been stretched. It can't hold anymore. And so it's not able to do that. And so that's the example Jesus is giving. You may have seen it when you shake up your buddy's can of soda a lot. And then say, here you go. And then when he opens it, what happens? Yeah, it just blows up everywhere. Well, the can has a lot more resistance than what happens with a a wineskin or anything like that. And so that's where it really talks about that type of thing. So we've got, I don't have a wineskin today, but I do have a balloon. That's the best I could come up with. Did anybody bring wine with them this morning? Okay, no, and communion's already over, so all right, we'll just use air. You're impressed I can blow it up, can't you? (laughs) So I'm putting something into the balloon, right? But fortunately, the balloon's kind of stretchy. So it's able to take that. And what Jesus is really talking about is about two different things, I believe, here. He's talking about the old law. And he's saying, you know, all of those rules and regulations, they don't bend very well. They don't stretch very well. And when you try to put more God into them, it doesn't work. 
It kind of breaks them. And if you insist on this ritual of fasting every single time for no purpose at all, you don't get closer to God and you don't get more of God. But it's really more about putting God into your life. And so what Jesus comes to bring is something that is more stretchy, more open. It is something that is much more flexible and it allows a bigger life. It allows more of God into a person's life. The second thing I think he's talking about is sometimes our lives are, you know, not all that clean, not all that straight, not all that good. And so we become very rigid in ourselves and we just don't have that much time for God. So maybe this week you had zero Bible study, zero prayers, not a single time when you even thought about God until Sunday morning. Okay, now I've got to go to church. And you start trying to put a little bit of God in. Well, what about the rest of the week? And you realize that, you know, you can get a little bit of God, but that's about it. That's all you're going to get is this much. And if you try to put more God in, it doesn't work very well. How much can it hold? It's getting pretty big, isn't it? But how much God do you want in your life? How much of God is there to be able to put into our human lives. It's getting bigger. (laughs) And eventually it's going to break. Because we decide, I just can't handle more of... You can't handle more God? Really? And Jesus comes so that we might be able to put God into our life. But he says, don't make your life so small that God has no place, that God has no room, or something is going to explode. And that's really what he's trying to get across. So it's a matter of us being able to have this kind of life. Here's what happens. Okay, there's supposed to be a different slide there, but it's not there. Here's what happens, and this is the point he's trying to make with this, is this Old Testament law just cannot contain all of what God has, because all it had was rules and regulations. In a world, life can't contain all of Jesus, ones that's focused on the world. And so we settle for tiny lives. And God becomes, you know, God, make me feel better today. I've got a cold. We say, God, I've got a flat tire. Please prevent that. God, please find me a parking space. (laughs) Do you realize you have the almighty creator and all you want is a parking space? Are you kidding me? But that's all our life has, is I'm on my way, I've got to get things done, I've got to get this accomplished, find me a parking space, God. Really? And that's it? We just don't have much room for majesty, do we? And so we've got to be able to find something much, much better, much, much bigger. Maybe God should fix our relationships that we have. Fix my marriage. Fix my friendships. Do you realize what you're asking? Do you have a relationship with the Almighty Creator? Of all things. Or do you just want to have Him fix the friends around you? It's just not enough. I mean, sure, He can fix that, but you can have an experience with God that is above everything. And you see this played out in, in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 5, which is at the end of the chapter, the section we read. Back up just a little bit if you have your Bibles open. I'm not going to put them on the screen. 
But Jesus goes there and he's teaching with some of the disciples. And he gets into Peter's boat and he pushes out and he begins to teach. And then he says, let down your nets for a catch. And of course they explain, no, we worked hard all night. And Jesus says, but I'm in the boat. And so they let down their nets for a catch. And sure enough, the catch is huge. They start pulling in fish and pulling in fish and the nets are breaking and the boats are sinking and they call for other people to come over and, you know, sure enough, there's fish and there's fish and there's fish everywhere and they're just about to sink both boats by the time they can finally get them to land. What would you say? What would you do? You see, our tiny life is, I hope I catch some fish. Jesus says, all right, we'll go fishing. And he's going to give you so many fish, you can't even put them into the boat or keep them in your net. He says, don't you realize how much bigger I am than what you're trying to do? I'll give you a whole year's worth of fish on your line at one time. Well, of course, they would break the line. They would break the net. They would sink the boat. He's saying, I am so much bigger than anything that you have. And it's being able to realize we're not thinking like God. We're not thinking big enough. He goes on from there in verse 12 to cleanse a leper. The leper says to him, you can make me clean. Well, that's great. Part of the problem with leprosy is it's incurable, first of all. And the second part is you could not be around anyone because it's very highly contagious. And so you actually have to stay away from the town. And any time you would go where there might be people, you have to cry out, unclean, unclean. And so when this leper says, you could make me clean... That's huge. You could make me socially acceptable. You could get me back into society. You could heal this disease. You could, and it's huge. And Jesus says, I'm willing. From an incurable disease and from somebody who's away from society, and he can be cleaner than all of them. And then it goes in verse 17 to a paralytic. The paralytic actually has to be let down through the roof. And when he's let down, you know what a paralyzed person is. It means they can't move, right? And so when he's let down, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Okay. And so we're all sitting here. Your sins are forgiven. Yeah. But that's not why we're here, is it? Why are you here? I need crutches. Is that all we wanted? Just to be able to hobble out? To have a crutch? Maybe to be able to walk okay. Maybe to be able to just stand up and... What if you could forgive the guy's sins along with that? And he says, I can completely heal everything in your life, not just the fact that you can't walk, but the fact that you can't have relationships because of the sin in your life, the fact that you can't even deal with yourself and you can't deal with your unhappiness and the anger and the resentment and everything else that goes on in your life because of all of this sin that you have built up in there. He says, I can heal all of that. And so when they let a paralyzed person down... He says, I can heal your paralysis because you were paralyzed from going to heaven. I can heal heaven. I can heal that process. I can heal all of this. And so in order to prove that you have something bigger, I'm going to say your sins are forgiven. Wow. That's impressive. Were people around impressed? If they understood God, then yes. Yes. But the Pharisees didn't understand God, and they said, he can't do that. He said, well, how about this? Just get up and go home. Take your bed. And he does. Which one is he happier for? 
I'd say the forgiveness of sin will change his life more than the fact that he can now walk. What an incredible thing it is to realize what God's able to do. In verse 27, he calls Matthew and he says, I want you to follow me. And Matthew is apparently a very popular guy, has a lot of friends around. And so Jesus goes to the party afterwards and all of Matthew's friends are there. And he says, you realize it's a choice. I mean, this isn't in the text, but this is what the story plays out as you realize this is a choice, them or me. You can be friends with the almighty God or you can have the tax collector friends. And it's the last time we have a record of Matthew being around his friends. He invites them to Jesus, invites Jesus in, says, I wish you guys could all know each other. And it doesn't. Because he's got to change his life. The Pharisees just don't get it at all. They're there too, and so they criticize. They're very judgmental and critical, and there's just not enough room for what Jesus is offering to put in their life. They want a judgmental God because they are judgmental. They want a God who's very demanding and maybe a little bit mean and angry as well, and Jesus doesn't seem to be like that, so they really can't do it. We need a big God for a big life. I saw this as a song that is out now. I don't know the tune. You're very fortunate. (laughs) Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. We need to remove limitations. We need to remove those things that would limit us like hatred and anger. Because we're going to say, oh, people make us mad. Well, nobody's making you mad. You're just mad. The limitation of lost faith because we can't even imagine what God's doing. I just can't believe anymore. Because you can't see God is big enough. Do you realize what you're talking about? Or the lack of forgiveness because we need to forgive other people. And so we don't feel forgiven. We feel guilty. Because maybe we haven't realized what a gift it is to be able to give to other people. We surrender to God. His Spirit fills us. He does all of these things so we can have God inside of us and we can be clean and we can be healed and we can be holy. But we only want a little bit of God. Not enough to change our life, not enough to lose our friends, but just enough to take up Sunday morning. And it's kind of getting long already, so... Not to be clean where it makes us uncomfortable or makes people around us uncomfortable, right? We try putting God into a life in the world. We realize he's the creator of the whole world. Of everything. It all glorifies him. No, we just wanted a nice vacation spot. That was it. You know, God, let me just go to a place where it's, you've created something nice, a beach somewhere. And I'll sit and put my feet in the water and uh, I'll say, wow, this is nice. And never see the majesty and the glory of what God has made as creator of all things. Or you try to put God into a selfish life and and God is love. He isn't selfish at all. But we want pleasures of sin. We don't really want holy God. If you want to put God into a sinful life, he is holy. If you try and put him in a selfish life, it's, you know, we want our rights. We want what's fair. We want everything coming to us. We don't want to miss out on anything. Do you realize what God gives? That is so much bigger than what's fair. And we're just trying to make sure we get ours. Now, God can be humble and he can fit anywhere. But he is still creator. He is still love. He is still holy. And he still gives absolute purpose and meaning to our life. He is the contrast to all the surroundings. And he affects every surrounding where he goes. And so do his people. And so does his church. The passage that in Luke 13, I think, describes this. Again, he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It's like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. 
Well, you may know, you already buy the bread with the holes in it, right? And it's already raised up. It's already even sliced for you. It's already in the package, but they didn't have that back then. And so the leaven is what makes bread nice and rise, and it makes it soft, and, you know, it's, it's what makes the mayonnaise go in the little holes, right? That's the best part of the whole thing anyway. Holes more mayonnaise that way. But here's what he says about this. This is about leaven, and it, just, it doesn't work fast. Leaven isn't loud. It's not like balloons. It doesn't do those things, but it just it works. They cook and they hit it in three measures of flour. Three measures. Like measuring cup, right? No, a measure is 13 liters. Measuring cup. Three of those. And that's going to rise. You're going to have something as big as you are. And so Jesus isn't using a little, you know, bread. It kind of rises. He says, and you know, church, it rises. I mean, it's huge if you had that kind of a measure in three. That's enough bread for all year. And so that's what he's trying to describe here. It rises. You've got 39 liters worth of bread to start with. And how big does that get? Because it gets several times its own size. And yet the church gets criticized because of the lack of the power of God. Maybe it's the people that just don't allow enough God into their life and don't see it. It's kind of a silent power like leaven is because it doesn't make a lot of noise at all. But God still changes lives. God still affects us. Does God ever get bigger than your Facebook page? Because Facebook is your whole life, right? I mean, you tell everybody everything on there and they can all put like... Does God ever get bigger than your Facebook page? You know, can't he be so big that you can't even describe it on Facebook? You can't even put the picture in there because it's just, it's too much. It doesn't hold all of those things. Would you ever fast for God? I mean, that was the Pharisee question. I mean, he isn't really asking that. He wants your repentance. He wants your dedication. He wants your attitude. He wants the language that you say to reflect him. As we were gone this summer, we were able to travel to Alaska, and I saw some incredible things. But one of those, it wasn't the balloon that was supposed to be earlier. (laughs) We did not see balloons in Alaska. But that's what a balloon looks like when you pop it, and it's full of water. And the water's still there, and gravity has not worked on it yet. All right? When you freeze the water, you get glaciers. Okay? Is anybody afraid of glaciers? Okay, there's some people, well, in Arizona, no wonder. (laughs) But they're not that scary. You think they're kind of quiet, they just sit there. But they're not quiet at all. There's lots of pops and things that go on as you get up closer to those. You can see where all the dirt is. You know what the dirt is? That's where it has come down the mountain and it has taken the mountain with it. So the mountain is no longer there. The valley exists because this water that was frozen now brings a mountain with it. It's not fast, but it does work. So this is a face of a glacier that you can go up to. Doesn't look very impressive, doesn't look very big. Why should we worry about glaciers after all they're receding, right? But what if they were coming at you? Would you be afraid of one? Eh, We can walk faster than that, right? This thing is 250 feet tall. Okay, so this little thing right here is a seal as big as you are. It's 250 feet tall. It is that much pressure. It is that much ice. It comes at you, and it regularly pops and falls, and things come off of it. It's really incredible to see what happens with that.
And what it does is it makes a mountain lay in just pebbles in a pond. It is powerful. It changes the face of the earth. Does your life do that? God puts these in. Does your life do that? Does it change the face of your surroundings? Well, God's pretty destructive to somebody who's unrepentant. No, I'm going to stay here. I am not going to do that. I am not going to choose anything that you want. Jesus even talks about enemies being in the same house. So maybe we try to avoid God. We don't find a place for him. I don't want him to fit. And if we ever do have to do God, it's more like trying to put a cactus in your pocket. You ever try to put a cactus in your pocket? Yeah, you're smarter than that. You know not to do that. It's going to be uncomfortable when it has all of those spines sticking out. And we try to say, let's put a little bit of God into your life. And we say, I can't do that. That's not going to fit in my life. And Because it's always poking me. It's always telling me I'm not doing what I should be doing. I'm not doing it the way I ought to be doing. I know I ought to be doing something else. And so it's like trying to carry that cactus around in your pocket. So we don't have room for that. Do you have room for his majesty? Do you have room for his glory? See, Jesus is offering a new life, not one that's just patched together. He says, don't have patches. And don't even go by the old way, the old law. He says, what I want you to have, and don't even go by your old life. I want you to have a new life. One that is open to the glory of God because grace is so powerful when you use it for others and when you use it for yourself. Not not being broken and busted, but being healed by Jesus. So if God had a miracle and it would take two hours, would you have time today? I mean, it's a busy afternoon, and it's already getting late, right? So would you have time today if God had a miracle, but it's going to take two hours? What if it took two years? What if it's like a glacier, and it's going to take 100 years? But there is going to be a miracle at the end of it. You're going to see a church so powerful. You're going to see a life so powerful. And that's what happens with most of us. It's not in the minute of the day. But when you get to the end of the person's life, you say, wow, God did amazing things in their life. And so what if it took a hundred years to see the power of God in your life? Well, the time to start is now. Open yourself up so that God is able to come in and learn to really appreciate and love and accept all of his power into your life. Would you come while we stand and sing? Restore.